Hello everyone, another Q&A video today. The questions today are about mycoplasma, about taking biofilm disruptors with food, and um, a question about overlapping symptoms of Lyme, long COVID, and parasites. So as per usual, nothing I'm saying should be construed as medical advice. This is for informational purposes only. If you need medical advice, please talk to your healthcare provider to get that advice. And if you don't mind taking a quick moment to please like, share, subscribe, and or post a quick comment on the video, I'd really appreciate it. So thanks in advance for taking a second to do that. Um, so first question is, about mycoplasma um, and so it says here uh, how long does it take for your patients to test negative for mycoplasma after your herbal treatment do you use the same herbs for urea plasma if not what would you suggest so thank you for the questions um, so it it varies um, <clears throat> with uh, in terms of how long it would take for someone to test negative for mycoplasma. Um, to be perfectly frank, um, a lot of my patients, after they're feeling asymptomatic, they don't bother getting retested. So to be to be honest, I we don't always know how long it takes for them to test negative because. Um, at least here in beautiful Nova Scotia, Canada, and throughout Canada, um, it's very challenging to get uh, testing for mycoplasma through the provincial socialized healthcare system. So patients have to pay for it out of pocket, and it you know, costs a couple hundred dollars to get it tested. So we, we don't always do follow up testing. Um, <clears throat> but generally speaking, for treating mycoplasma using the herbal protocols that I work with, um, it's like treating any systemic infection, you know, whether it's Lyme, whether it's uh, Bartonella, <clears throat> whether it's Babesiosis, um, it oftentimes will take somewhere in the realm, like depending on the case, and it really varies, but you know, usually somewhere in the realm of maybe two to six months, um, but there are some cases that it, it does take longer, especially if there are multiple infections, multiple other things going on, like mold toxicity and heavy metals and the whole kit and caboodle. And then if there are biofilms, then that can add, um, you know, anywhere from an extra two to six months on top of that to deal with. So it can, it can really be extended in some cases, but <clears throat> for just straight up mycoplasma, no biofilms, I'd say, you know, on average, around maybe two to six months, give or take. Um, and then the I, I do use the same herbal regimen for urea plasma, um, <clears throat> but the in terms in terms of the systemic herbs, but then um, for urea plasma, I would also tend to um, bring biofilm disruptors into the mix sooner versus later, um, just because of the uh, propensity for these chronic embedded um, UTIs to be really, really tough to treat. So um, using um, silver hydrosol, I've talked in other videos about my favorite product, which I have no financial affiliation with, but it's a product called ACS200 by this company called Results RNA, which is a great product in my opinion. Um, and so I bring that in, you know, usually sooner versus later um, for treating that, that urea plasma. So thank you for the questions. <clears throat> excuse me, the next one is about uh, taking the phase two biofilm disruptor uh, with food. So uh, it says, is it possible to take a phase two biofilm disruptor with food? Uh, most of the biofilm disruptors cause irritation and digestive anomalies for me. Can you recommend something that I could take with food? So thank you for the questions. Um, as for always, I can't give any advice over social media to anyone individually. Um, however, just speaking uh, generally, speaking academically, um, with you know, taking a phase two biofilm disruptor with food, it's it's a really good question. I mean, <clears throat> the individual components with um, a, a phase two biofilm disruptor, and it depends on the biofilm disruptor. You know, you take something like, uh, you know, using the example of something like silver hydrosol, um, I think silver hydrosol gets into the, um, into the circulatory system really easily. I think it's, to my understanding, the pharmacokinetics show that it's very well absorbed. So that's one that's likely, in my opinion, not gonna interact with the food. It's not a chelator or something like that. But if we're talking about, well, let me see which video this was posted on. Um, okay, man, a lot of comments on this video, 101 comments. So thank you, thank you for all the comments uh, on the uh, why do some biofilm disruptors not work video. So if one was going after gut biofilms, I, I personally wouldn't usually use silver in that case because to my understanding, it is really well absorbed systemically. So it's probably not going to make its way down into the parts of the intestine that we want to be having it bro broken down in. Um, so using a phase two biofilm disruptor like EDTA or DMPS or DMSA or the bismuthyl complex, uh, 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 bismuth ALA like dithyl complex, that would likely be a better choice is what I would use with my patients. With those, I mean, I've used bismuth with food and alpha lipoic acid with food, and it seems to work well when I'm treating, uh, you know, gut 
microbial overgrowth issues like um, hydrogen sulfide gas producing SIBO, which we use bismuth for that on a regular basis. Um, I use aflopoic acid for treating neuropathy and I give that with or without food on a regular basis. It seems to work well. Um, so I think those can probably be taken with food. Uh, but then when we get into the chelators, the concern is that if they're taken with food, then the chelators may bind up the minerals that are in the food because chelators much prefer to bind heavy metals. That's their highest binding affinity, but they will bind minerals if they don't have anything else to bind to. Um, with that being said, if a person was consuming something that didn't have any minerals in it, then it might not, or you have a very, very low mineral concentration, then it might be okay to take it. So if I had a patient in my practice, they were finding that uh, they couldn't tolerate the biofilm disruptor on an empty stomach, then, you know, I might talk to them about maybe just taking it with something like just with meat, um, which would have a fairly low mineral content to it. And maybe that would be okay, but I'd probably try to get away with the smallest amount of meat possible. Uh, what I'd probably try first with one of my patients would be having them take something to kind of coat or soothe their stomach um, to, before taking the biofilm disruptor and hopefully that would just make it better tolerated to take it on an empty stomach. So I would probably try that first in my own practice, but um, it, that's my understanding the main reason that we want to separate out those chelators is because we don't want them to just bind up the minerals in the food and then you don't get the benefit of the minerals and then you also don't have the binding sites available to you know actually bind up the metals that are in the biofilm and do the work that needs to be done uh, but again the bismuth and the alpha-lipoic acid they might be okay with food i just generally always dose biofilm disruptors before bed away from everything else so i, I don't really have any clinical experience with how effective that might be and then the last question here <clears throat> is it says, um, can Lyme, long COVID, and parasites have overlapping symptoms? Are there treatments that deal with all three, um, if not sure about diagnostics? So it's a really good question. Um, yes, there are, you know, look at the yeah, symptoms of persistent Borreliosis slash chronic Lyme and long COVID. The symptoms can be identical uh, with parasites. Depends on the parasite. I mean, babesiosis, yep, can cause the exact same symptoms. Uh, intestinal parasites could cause entirely different symptoms, so that would stand out quite a bit. So I would say that the parasites, generally not a lot of overlapping symptoms. There can be some, but it's usually pretty obvious with parasites because there'd be digestive issues, whereas with long COVID and Lyme, we don't typically see digestive issues, although we can in some cases, but usually don't. So that would kind of stand out a fair bit. Um, and then, uh, let's see here. And then in terms of treatments that deal with all three, um, I would say generally not. Um, certain causes of chronic complex chronic illness do have overlap in terms of which treatments can be effective for them, but I would generally say that those three things are, they all stand apart quite a bit. Um, well, you know, working, uh, you know, when it comes to a comprehensive treatment of those conditions, <clears throat> we would generally want to be working with things to help you know, rebuild the mitochondria, you know, so get those energy production pathways working better, maybe working with certain things to immunomodulate to get the immune system working better. So there'd be some common threads there, but kind of the most direct kind of heavy hitting things for Lyme and long COVID and parasites would generally be quite different in my experience, at least. Uh, with Lyme, we'd want to, of course, be working with systemic antimicrobials like cryptolepis and alcornia and Japanese knotweed and the herbs that I talked about in the other videos that I posted about treating chronic infections. So please check those out on my YouTube channel or other way, other places if you're interested in that. Um, with long COVID, um, generally the heavier hitters would be working with um, proteolytic enzymes away from food, working with immunomodulators like quercetin and N-acetylcysteine. Um, those would be kind of more of the things that would work. You know, sometimes we'll bring antivirals in the mix, but it's kind of hit or miss whether they work. Um, sometimes nicotine therapy, like nicotine patch therapy can be helpful for really, really tough cases. Um, and then with parasites, it would be antiparasitic. So things like wormwood and black walnut, and then uh, my personal favorite antiparasitic um, regimen herb, which is uh, mimosa pudica. So I've posted about antiparasitic regimens before um, on other videos too. So please check those out for more details if you'd like. Um, but yeah, there's not really a, a one size fits all for all of those, um, unfortunately. So we, we love the two for ones, the three for ones, the four for ones. Those therapies do exist out there, but um, there's not really a single therapeutic trial that's going to work on all of them in my experience. Um, so thank you for the, that question as well. Um, I hope that uh, this information was of interest. If anybody has any questions on these topics or anything else, just post in the comment section below and I will do my best to answer as soon as I can.